The economy is going to come right back. Maybe. We have, well, states asking for money. Your money. I'll tell you why that's a problem. And finally, <laughs> the Donald Trump Twitter account strikes again. All that's coming up right now on I'm Right. Okay, brace yourself. We've got some bad news. <laughs> it's not it's not the best news in the world, but uh, um, on top of everything else that's going on, we've got a pandemic, got 30 million people unemployed. No one's even talking about opening anything up again for another 10 days. Uh, oil is trading at a negative dollar amount. Now, I'm not some stockbroker. I'm not even sure exactly what that means, but I know this. That's not good. When they're flat out basically telling you I'll buy oil from you, that doesn't seem good at all. And understand, I do know this about oil. When they tap oil in the ground, let's say I found a big pool of oil. I'm, you know, I'm jet clamping. I took a shot and I got oil coming out of the ground. I tapped some. Once you tap it, oil doesn't stop flowing. You don't get to go out to an oil well that you're just churning and burning on and just hit the off switch and say, huh, we clearly have pr plenty. The price is so low, I'll just wait till the price comes back up. No, that oil is coming, no matter what you do. And so once you have an oil glut in the market, once you have too much oil and the price plummets like this, you have quite a pickle on your hands. You basically have to store it, which creates a whole new host of other problems. And understand this, it was you know four, negative $40 today. Oil has to trade at a certain point that's well above zero before it becomes profitable. Whatever that point is, it's always adjusting. But let's say, uh, this is not right, but let's say oil has to trade at $50 a barrel, barrel to become profitable. Otherwise, you break even or lose money. Well, if oil's at 25, you're still screwed. If oil's at 40, you're still screwed. That's not making any money. Even if it's at 51, you can do it, but it's hard to make any money on it. If it's at negative 40, Ugh, that's really bad. And it is really bad when you consider all the things that oil funds, all the things that oil is involved in. I mean, the setting aside just oil itself and all the industries that surround it. I used to sell RVs for a living. I was amazing at it, not to brag or anything. But our industry right here in the great state of Texas was dependent on oil prices. Oh, you're always going to sell a few. But we always wanted oil prices to be way up here. Oil prices high meant all the oil wells were churning and burning, meant everybody was coming in and buying RVs. You never would have even thought about that, right? There are so many industries connected to just the oil industry in the United States of America. It would blow your mind if we broke it all down. Plus, all the things that are made from oil. That that iPhone, all the greenies have that they hate oil. You know, they're always out there at the protest filming on their iPhone. And, and oil now and fossil fuels. Yeah, that, that's made from oil. Almost everything you use in your life, most of the things you use, oil touches it somehow. So when you have such a major part of the economy that's bad, that's bad. And what's worse is, and I say this is what's worse, try to put a sunny face on this, people. Don't yell at me. What's worse is this is not necessarily tied to coronavirus in the lockdowns. Now, some of it obviously is. You have a bunch of gas stations that are sitting on a bunch of fuel. Why? Because no one's filling up their car. Why? Because our idiot government told everybody to stay home. So they're not driving. You've been out on the roads lately. If you're allowed to go out without getting arrested, what, are, what don't you see? Other cars. I drive to work. It takes me five seconds. It used to take three hours. That's how it is now. So that's hurting oil. Look, none of it's good. Right now, none of it's good. The oil stuff came separate from coronavirus. Saudi Arabia, Russia started playing some games, decided to play with us at the wrong time, kind of cut off their noses despite their faces. They did it to screw us because we're churning out oil like no tomorrow. And now we have an issue, which I normally wouldn't even bother going into for the opening of the show. It just, it compounds everything. But the good news is this, people. Look, I've got some great news for you. Bad news always comes in threes, doesn't it? First, we have a horrible pandemic killing people. Then we have an economy that's nose diving. Now oil, basically the biggest part of our economy is nose diving. That's all three done. The way I see it, this is rock bottom, baby. We're about to be shooting up.
You know who else thinks we're about to be shooting up? I probably should put that different, but either way. You know who else thinks we're about to be shooting up? Steve Mnuchin. I, I think it will be months. I definitely don't think it will be years. We are going to conquer this virus. We are going to have terrific breakthroughs. I know both not just on the testing, but on the medical front, we begin to have virals. I, I think there's things that are being developed for vaccines, which will take a little bit longer. But one of the things we heard is people want testing. People also will react very positively that they know if they get this disease, there will be medical treatments available as well. Okay. Look, I have some issues with Steve Mnuchin. I believe he's a bit out of touch with the working man from what I've seen, some statements he's made. But overall, I don't mind that message coming from the federal government. I don't mind when Donald Trump gets up there and says the economy is going to bounce right back. And when Mnuchin says it's just going to take months and not years. Now, I think he's full of crap, but I don't mind him sharing that message. The American people, it doesn't hurt to give them a message of positivity right now. It doesn't. If your small business is destroyed, and I mean permanently closed, and look, it's not for debate anymore. We've closed permanently, lots of them. You don't come back in a month. And you don't just, let's rally around and fire up again in two months. That's, that's not in any way how it works. And while normally your business would simply be replaced by someone else's, well, nobody has that kind of capital right now. So no, I don't think it'll be much, which brings me to one more little problem. Well, a big problem, we're paying people to stay home now. And you can say, well, we should, government shut them down. And yeah, on some level, I understand that. On some level, I agree with that. Government points to me and says, Jesse, go home. You can't work, you're not allowed to earn a living. Well, you better pay me some money then if you're gonna make me do that. So I get all that. But we extended lots of these benefits Till July, we're going to pay people what amounts to $52,000 a year to stay home until July. So we have all these unemployed people now. They're all jumping on, you know, got to jump on that gravy train. You might as well. A lot of people weren't making that anyway. Let's say, and this won't happen, but let's say everything opens up on, on May 1st. We're open for business, baby. Well, why would I go back to work? What if I was just making 40 grand a year, 45? Well, I mean, I'm, I guess I'll go back maybe in August. Maybe I'll start looking in July. I'm not in any hurry to take a pay cut, head back to work. Why would I do that? You see the issue? Now we're handing out these government checks and we're paying people to stay home. And it gets, well, it gets angering after a while, and that's why you see what we see right now. And remember I told you last week, and everybody yelled at me and mocked me, and I told you all, they had the first one of those protests, those, those get back to work, open up America again protests. And, everybody, and I told everyone, I said, there is a storm coming. There is an anger building. You do not understand it. If you're in the D.C., New York City bubble, you do not get it. Everybody laughed. Everyone said, ah, oh, you're an idiot. People aren't even that mad. They look mad. Austin had stay-at-home protests over the weekend. Here's Austin. Oh, yeah. That's not exactly in the conservative bastion of Texas. That's in Austin, Texas, which is essentially San Francisco of the South. That's a big deal. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. They've got their own. Chesterfield, Virginia. They've got their own. We now have people, as of today, showing up armed to these things. People, let, hear me out really quickly before we wrap things up here. I'm all about Americans being armed. I'm all about you using your Second Amendment rights. Protect yourself. Protect your family. Don't hurt anybody. Let's cool off a little bit. Don't be out there hurting anybody. Everybody take a chill pill. But... I do think it is important to let your voice be heard at these protests. If you're hurting, if you're angry, if you're broke, let them know. Because these politicians only care about one thing, remaining politicians. And if they're worried that you're angry enough to make sure they're not going to remain politicians, well, then you'll actually see some change. Let your voice be heard. All of that may have made you uncomfortable, but I'm right. All right, we got more. Hang on. Thank <laughs> you.
We have some pretty great messengers now for our party. Look, as I've said several times, I feel like Democrats have screwed up big time when they've allowed Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi to be the two leading voices for their party. I understand Joe Biden's going to be the nominee for president. At least that's how it looks. Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House. That is a big, big, big shot position. So you can't exactly hide her under the bed somewhere. But I'll never understand why they allow those two people, of all people, to be the voice for their party. Joe Biden can't talk. Joe Biden cannot even, his brain is not even functioning. And Nancy Pelosi, even back when she was fully functional, is not a likable human being. I don't know her personally, it's not my business, but she comes across like a snobby San Francisco liberal. It does not come across well. Middle America can't stand her. It was that way back when I was running for Congress and lost twice back in 2010. We had to pull everything and see who pulled good and who pulled badly. Guess who pulled the absolute worst? This was a decade ago. Nancy Pelosi. Everyone hated her guts. Half the Democrats hated her guts. So I'll never get that. We, on the other hand, as a party, we're getting younger. We're getting better at combating the left's message. And one of the people who's been dynamite about that, of calmly just shooting down everything Democrats say, has been Dan Crenshaw. Check out him absolutely disemboweling Bill Maurer. Peter Navarro, somebody else who talks to Trump a lot, told him directly January 29th, you got to get ahead of this. February two days 10th. Later, he, and two days later, he implemented a restrictive tra tra travel ban from China, which he was widely criticized no, for. I, you know, that same well, day, on January 31st, Nancy Pelosi proposed the No Ban Act, which would be congressional limitation on what President Trump's actually able to do with that with that travel restriction. Okay, but that tra I mean, he lies about that. He first of all, he well, didn't. How does he lie about it? What do, he, what do you mean? He said he stopped people coming in from China. He did not. He said he was ahead of it. 43 countries did it before we did. There are still people coming in from China. He only stopped yeah. foreign nationals. Yeah, okay, let, 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 me, let me address that, because I, I know that's, that's what people are saying right now. But the reality is that yeah, was about 40,000 people came in after that. These were U.S. citizens and green card holders and passport holders being repatriated. U.S. citizens. So you have to make the argument yeah. then that, that we shouldn't allow them in. I mean, it, it sounds to me like you're fully agreeing with President Trump on this when everybody else disagreed with him. And, no, and if I, you're saying that you wish that, that that travel restriction had been more extreme, okay, fine. I well, mean, I, I, you apparently had the foresight back then, but when nobody else did. But the fact right. is, you okay. know, we, if Joe Biden was in charge at that moment, he's already said he wouldn't have done it. He criticized it as, at the time. Nancy hey. Pelosi actually proposed legislation to, to stop it. Can somebody call 911? We just had a murder on national television. That was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Calmly just tear the guy to bits. And Bill Maher, it's amazing how things change when they don't have the audience of clapping seals, cheering them on. Woo, I love you, Bill. When it's just you and him, it gets ugly. Messaging. Well, you remember I mentioned Nancy Pelosi? Here's her winning message. I'm afraid that he's going to act on the set basis of what he's acted before. It's a hoax. It's magically going to disappear. And that's why I sent out the letter that I did after Easter, because Easter gave me time for reflection and prayerfulness about, okay, we don't want to keep harping on what he did wrong, because he failed. And he's failed in the testing and the rest, and it's a hoax, and, and uh, uh, it's going to magically disappear. That's not based on science. This isn't magical. This is scientific. And so I said, if he, if he continues to predicate the action uh, that we take on a false premise, uh, then we're in further danger. And his earlier delay and denial caused deaths. And so it's very important that we walk the line that is close to evidence, data, science, uh, as we go forward, and not whimsy, magic, hoax, uh, uh, allegations and placing dream, game, placing blame instead of taking responsibility. Yeah, she's doing well. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry, I don't mean to get sidetracked, but it's my show, I can talk about whatever I want. How is that person the face of your party right now? How? You still have to message your party to the United States of America. Even if you're Nancy Pelosi and you love the power and you love the attention, which she undoubtedly does. That's how you get to that position in life. 
Um, if you enjoy being Speaker of the House, you really should shut up because that kind of messaging is not going to go over well with middle America. What is she even talking about besides losing her train of thought and repeating herself 90 times? Oh, not content with just rolling out Pelosi and Joe Biden, Democrats also, they love them some Bill de Blasio. President Trump at this point is the Herbert Hoover of his generation. There's a massive national crisis going on, and he is consistently late and, and very you know, marginal in what he does. He's taking actions that are far, far behind the curve and aren't addressing the core concerns. Herbert Hoover? <laughs> Look, here's the issue. Donald Trump has not been perfect throughout this process, undoubtedly. But when you have Bill de Blasio there, when you have him saying things like Herbert, Herbert Hoover of our generation, you lose ground. There is ground to be made up here if you're a Democrat, and you're purely looking at this for political reasons. There's ground to be made up. There is. The president hasn't been perfect. You can approach this in a way, well, uh, here's the thing. I, I really think this has been great for the, um, for, uh, for the Democrat Party because it proves about, you know, the Republican Party's failings for this. and the, You can gain ground there. I get that. What you can't do is rule out Nancy Pelosi and Bill de Blasio to be your messengers for it. You say stupid things like Herbert Hoover. And look, not to insult the intelligence of most Americans, but the truth of the matter is most people don't know squat about Herbert Hoover. They don't even know what the heck he's talking about. Oh, and as long as we're doing the Monday morning quarterback thing here, here's Pelosi and de Blasio and the rest of them early. The risk to New Yorkers for coronavirus is low. And our city preparedness is high. This should not stop you from going about your life, should not stop you from going to Chinatown and going out to eat. I'm going to do that today myself. Come to Chinatown. Here we are. We're, again, careful, safe, and come join us. There is no concern at this time for coronavirus in our region. The Department of Sanitation is ready for Mardi Gras 2020. The facts are reassuring. We want New Yorkers to go about their daily lives. But there's really no need to panic and to avoid activities that we always do as New Yorkers. We are hardy people. Americans do not need to panic. What I would suggest, however, mm -hmm. is that Americans take this as a wake-up call for seasonal flu. There's very little threat here. This disease, even if you were to get it, basically acts like a common cold or flu. So we're telling New Yorkers, go about your lives, take the subway, go out, enjoy life. Oh. Oh, that's funny, isn't it? I love videotape. Isn't it wonderful? Look, nobody saw this coming. You couldn't have done more than we did at the very beginning and have any kind of public support for it. You could not have. That's just the truth. And you can try to Monday morning quarterback that all day long, but the proof's in the pudding. You people didn't know. All right. We got Raheem Kassam. Hang on. Joining me now, the editor-in-chief of warroom.org, Raheem Kassam. And as you may be able to tell from his horrendous accent, he is not from the United States of America. Raheem, how are things in Singapore or wherever you are? <laughs> Perfectly fine here in Singapore, Jesse. The weather is absolutely lovely. I encourage everybody to join me here in Singapore as soon as they can. <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, outstanding. All right, uh, getting down to what, well, everything we're dealing with today. We have negative oil prices. We have the friggin' Treasury Secretary saying the economy is going to come back in months. You know what? Let's deal with that first. Yeah. Stephen Uchin comes out and says the economy is going to come right back in months. I understand he's being encouraging, and I actually don't mind that. From Trump, from Mnuchin, I, I, I appreciate that. I have a very hard time believing that's true when I'm hearing the stories I'm hearing. Do you think we can? If we had, if we had just slowed down a little, I would agree, but we didn't, did we? Mm, it depends on who you talk to. I mean, a lot of people will tell you that what we have at the moment across the Western world is not the quote-unquote full mitigation that some people uh, were pushing for at the very beginning. A lot of people will tell you that actually this does represent and has represented as fullest as mitigation as a, as a Western economy can, you know, quote-unquote handle, whether or not it's 
handled it or, or not, I think remains to be seen. Here's the question. Um, how much is consumer confidence going to come roaring back before the end of the year? A lot of that will depend on, as you say, the public pronouncements of people that are trusted by um, ordinary people who will spend money. And, and where is the money coming from that they'll be spending to inject into the economy? If we see uh, the big corporations uh, taking the small business loans, as we've seen over the last couple of days, I think Shake Shack has had to say that it's now handing back some of the money that it was promised uh, because they got basically rumbled and saying, you're not a small business, you don't need a loan from the government to keep going um, and whether or not you know our core infrastructure uh, the travel infrastructure airlines etc cetera, etc cetera, will be able to operate normal services and whether they will therefore be able to employ people all of those things remain to be seen and I suspect will be part of a broader political game played out by the Democrats ahead of the election um, I think you know on the on the shutdown versus versus mitigation kind of thing uh, we're in a position now where I think, you know, we're 10 days away from the end of the 30 days to slow the spread. Um, I think you'll come back a little slower in terms of people walking out in the streets and shaking hands and ordering Uber Eats and going to restaurants and going to their barbers and things like that. But there's no doubt about it in my mind that by the end of the summer, fingers crossed, most people will be returning, at least in the way they lead their lives, in a sort of normal going about places fashion. It'll be up to those businesses, whether they restrict the number of people coming in at a time, whether you see cinemas or baseball stadiums or that kind of thing opening. We had Mark Cuban on the show this morning talking about the um, uh, the propensity for people to go to uh, ball games again. And he said, uh, for him, the test is, would I send my children? And right now the answer is no, but I think that will drastically change in the next couple of months. Raheem, before we get to the political end of that, and we've got a ton of that stuff to talk about, I am concerned a great deal about a second wave, not just for the lives that will be lost, even though oftentimes the second wave is worse than the first wave, like in the Spanish flu. I'm worried that we've already put in the minds of the American people, and everybody knows you and I don't agree on this stuff, but we've already put in the minds of the American people that once this thing breaks out, lockdown is the answer. So what if we do this again? What if this is three or four months from now and we get another outbreak? Six months from now, we get another outbreak. Dude, even if we wanted to, we cannot do this again, right? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think the market has a lot of that priced in from what we're seeing in the last couple of uh, weeks and especially in the last 12 hours, six hours, three minutes uh, per the oil prices. Um, and, uh, it, you know, that that I don't think is a possibility. Now, there are countries who are talking about doing that, and I would argue that where I'm from, the United Kingdom, is arguing about doing that, and I think that's an incredibly wrong-headed thing to do. Remember, the point of a lockdown was not to eradicate the disease. The point of a lockdown was not to try and play, you know, Frogger with the coronavirus. The point of a lockdown was to make sure that we weren't inundated in our healthcare systems, um, you know, in, in wider society with people people uh, dropping down unable to work from all of this and there have been plenty of studies to suggest and I realize that we can all throw studies at one another right now but I'm satisfied um, that the first round of measures were enough to defer that and the first round of measures were enough to actually save the economy money in the long run by spreading out the, the level of infection, you can't really do it again. And the worst thing about it is that a second wave may occur in, you know, peak flu season, the time of the year that viruses uh, can, can, can proliferate the worst. So we are going to have to see changes in the way that, that businesses run. That will be up to them for themselves, I hope, not mandated by government. But I hope most people will be, you know, I hope my pub, which is which is here in Singapore across the street from me, um, <laughs> will, will, will not be allowing, you know, 300 people in uh, on a Friday night like they have been used to doing. Look, it might hurt the bottom line. Maybe they're unsustainable at that level. I don't know. But a lot of businesses are going to look at this and go, right, what can we do? What can't? we do and where's when where are we going to find the balance and you know what jesse here's something that you'll like i trust the american spirit and the entrepreneurs in america to make that distinction more than i trust anybody else in the entire world ah oh, well i can't can't agree with you more there in all seriousness the uk how they handled it i know this thing hit them hard i know look it's fun to have conservative talking points and it's really the truth that their healthcare system is you know it's their government run system so it has some serious flaws how has it give me the straight answer how has it held up through this 
Well, unfortunately, the National Health Service seems to be the politician's number one priority rather than protecting the public. They go out there every day in front of the cameras and they have big signs in front of them that says, you know, hashtag save the NHS. No, no, no. The NHS was supposed to save the people, right? I'm all for mitigating the impact on these things, but we have a, we have a cultist approach to our health service in the United Kingdom. Now, look, um, we've had a, a, a higher rate of deaths um, than I think most people uh, realistically expected. I think we're hitting 17,000 um, on the day. We obviously lumbered into this in a, in a, in a uh, manner which was not backed up by any of the science. We, we had this initial herd immunity approach to the thing, which I think we would have seen three, four, maybe five times the number of people um, who have been affected by this be, become affected. But at the same time, we've gone now the wrong way. We've gone too far in the other direction with police effectively asking people on the streets, whether it's their first time or their second time out, threats of being arrested if you're thought to go out for a non-essential journey in your day. And this is what, you know, this I'm afraid to sound trite and, and you know, like a sort of uh, turning point USA star for here, but this is what socialism does. When you're used to the National Health Service, when you're used to wealth, the welfare state, the, the police and the politicians will suck up as much power as humanly possible as quickly as possible. The reason I'm less worried about that in America than anywhere else is because you have your guns and you're willing to defend your freedoms. The British public are kind of just rolling over on the back of all of this and saying, well, if the government's telling me I have to do this, then I suppose I have to do it. And you and I are on the same page with that. I don't think that lockdown means being policed inside your houses. I don't like the Chinese model of barricading you in. I wanted a situation whereby people were responsible in what they were touching um, and how often they were touching it, um, which is kind of the way I live my life. Um, but the British government taking that way beyond um, the, the extreme now and talking about keeping the country on lockdown for the next 18 months, it's idiotic. All right, big question here that may take a little longer to answer than I wanted. When did that happen in the UK? Because look, I, I don't, I'm not, it's not my home country, but I've always loved it, you know that. I think most Americans have some sort of affinity for it. They feel a kinship with, with you know, Brits. That's just natural, and I like that. When did they become okay with this? Have they always been this way? Was this World War II? When did this happen to the UK? It, do you know, it's a really uh, interesting question that requires decades to answer. Everybody has their theories on it. I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Enoch Was Right about a politician called Enoch Powell in the United Kingdom. And he really traces a lot of it back to that initial post-war period for us. Post-Second World War, we changed subjecthood to citizenship because the Canadians who were part of our empire didn't want to seem like they still were subjects of Her Majesty the Queen. You know, I blame Canada for everything, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we opened the borders at the time as well. And really, as the British ruling classes lost their vice grip over the empire abroad, they tightened the vice grip around the empire at home, um, really removing piece by piece people's rights. And then, of course, in the 70s, giving those rights up to Brussels, even further away from home. Now, we've wrestled control back to Westminster. It's now time to wrestle them back home to within our own homes. Raheem Kassam, go read his stuff. I appreciate you, my friend. Thanks, brother. How about that for some good stuff? All right. Um, we have police drones over people's backyards? I'm not kidding. Hang on. If you're getting that funny feeling... The hair on the back of your neck starting to stand up and you're getting this eerie, eerie feeling. Let me tell you what that feeling is. That feeling is the fact that you're about to get screwed by the federal government and the various states across this country. And what have I been telling you this entire time? That state and local governments, they have budgets. They have budgets they pretty much have to stick to. I mean, yeah, they can take loans and do the bond thing and things like that, but they can't do what the feds can do, which is just print money. Just all day long, print money. And, well, they're starting to look at those state budgets. And since they torpedoed their own economy, many of them on purpose, like Michigan and California and <coughs> Virginia, the bottom line don't look too good. That profit loss sheet you get as a governor, it doesn't look too good. And what I've been worried about this entire time, well... It's coming true. The states aren't looking around and saying, 
hey, we made this decision. We really have to live with it. Let's figure out a way we can cut back on things. No, 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 no. You know what they're saying, don't you? Don't you already know before I even tell you? Please, daddy government, save us. We need bailout money. Illinois, to their credit, they understand how scummy and repugnant they are. They're just flat out asking for money for pensions. I swear on my life. This is uh, Senator Don Harmon asking Congress for a bailout. These are just a couple things that are in there. $10 billion for pension relief. As if you and I are supposed to be on the hook for Illinois' disastrous pension system. $15 billion in block grant funding. This might be my favorite part. With no specified purpose. <laughs> uh, yeah, just here's, here's $15 billion. 15 big ones. Just spend it however you want. Whatever, we'll figure something out. And another billion dollars in public grant dollars for access to health care in undes underserved communities. I point out Illinois because, well, it's Illinois. I mean, pretty much every governor they've ever had is in the clink at this point in time. That's what they do as a state. But I point them out because they're the first. They'll be one of many. Why do you think, let me tell you a little secret. Why do you think Cuomo added 3,700 people, dead people who'd never been tested for coronavirus onto the coronavirus death rules? Why do you think he did that? Money. Because that budget passed. And guess what was in that budget? Money for each and every dead coronavirus patient you have. Once you've incentivized it, you're going to get a lot more of it. Why do you think Gavin Newsom and Cuomo have been playing footsie with Trump this whole time? You think they just grew up one day and were like, you know, I really should work with the president. No, oh, it's all about money. They don't want him to turn off the faucet. Unless we hold these people accountable for what they've done now, they're not going to stop doing it. All right. Speaking of New Yorkers, well, Bill de Blasio, listen to this. How on earth do you think that New York City, which has been the epicenter of this crisis, can get back on our feet without federal support? I remember famously in the 1970s when one of your predecessors, Gerald Ford, didn't care to help New York City during the fiscal crisis. There was that famous daily news cover that said, Ford to city, drop dead. So my question is, Mr. Trump, Mr. President, are you going to save New York City or are you telling New York City to drop dead? Which one is You're the mayor. <laughs> Donald Trump is not the mayor of New York City. All these states and cities love to, I'm my own state. You won't tell us what to do. You can't, you can't say that to me. I, I am independent. I am on my own. And then the second they get in trouble, hey, president's leaving us to die here. You're Bill de Blasio. Your city's been ravaged by coronavirus. The federal government has bent over backwards, sending you ventilators and hospital ships. Every charity's mobilized. We got, we got empty hospital tents all across New York. And you got the gall to say stuff like that? Oh, and just a quick change of gears here, because I'm actually going to do an entire segment on this really soon. You know one of the worst casualties that's going to come out of this thing? Something nobody's talking about except for me? public trust in law enforcement, which was already frankly hurting thanks to James Comey and that whole FISA warrant fiasco. But when you ask police officers, who sometimes seem like they're really enjoying it, but when you ask salt of the earth police officers to do things like send, dro send drones into people's backyards, don't expect the public's gonna come out of this and feel a lot better about the people who protect them. If these drones save one life, it is clearly worth the activity and the information that the drones are sending. Um, what? What? It's for the public, it, what? People, this is not China. You know China has that creepy facial recognition software where, there, where the public cameras will recognize you? And we all saw this. This was like two or three months ago, you remember? And we all looked and we were like, um, that's creepy. That's pretty much the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. And now here, without batting an eye, we have a mayor telling the cops to fly drones over people's houses. And they're doing it. And I don't want to go off on a tangent here. I'm going to do this another time. But let me just say, 
Public trust in law enforcement is critical to holding together a civil society. Maybe you're screaming at the TV right now, saying, Jesse, you should never trust them. That's not true. You should be able to trust law enforcement. It helps hold society together. When you tell cops to put people in handcuffs for playing softball in the park with their daughter, you're destroying public trust. When you're flying drones over people's backyards, you're destroying public trust. When you mobilize police boats to arrest a man paddleboarding in the ocean by himself, you're eroding public trust. The public will remember. There are people growing up right now, they're watching these things. They're like, uh, what? Kids right now are watching these. You think that isn't going to make an impression? Oh, it is. Hang on. Joining me now with a different point of view, Sarah Gonzalez with the news and why it matters on Blaze TV. I never miss it and neither should you, mainly because I'm on it a lot as well. Sarah, um, we now have negative oil prices and I don't know where it is or how it is where you live, but here in Texas, that's, that's not a good thing. Uh, no, it's not a good thing. And uh, it's also not a good thing to uh, just tell all of the people within your state that they are not allowed to work, that they are not allowed to provide for their families, uh, that they are not allowed to fend for themselves. So no, there are a lot of things going on right now here in this place that we used to call America that are not good things that are contributing to, uh, to, to a lot of also not good things when it comes to the economy. Yeah, that is a fact. And I, I, I tell you, I see this giant sucking sound coming out of D.C. right now, and it's all of the money I'm ever going to make. It's all the money my kids are ever going to make, their kids are ever going to make. We're now going to pass another bailout bill. Instead of just firing up the economy again, we're going to pass another bailout bill. We have the individual states with Republicans and Democrats lobbying for tossing federal money at all these states who have locked down their states and torpedoed their own economy. Sir, we can't we can't do this forever. This is going to shatter every deficit record we've ever had. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, the states want these rights, which they are entitled to. The states want these rights to, you know, make the decisions for their own state. But as Uncle Ben said to uh, Peter Parker in a really great movie once, with great power <laughs> comes great responsibility. I mean, you've got to back up that power with responsibility. And your responsibility is that you have to then pay for those mistakes, for those bailouts, if that means raising taxes in your state, if that means cutting spending in your state, then that's what it should mean. But that certainly shouldn't mean that uh, people in neighboring states that had nothing to do with your state's decision should then spend their hard-earned money bailing you out. It just absolutely makes no sense whatsoever, and uh, it's, it's very discouraging to see. Would you rather be Spider-Man or the Incredible Hulk or one of the less interesting female superheroes? Oh, the female superheroes, I can't do. But um, I think I think I would I would like to be the Incredible Hulk. I have some anger issues, and that seems to be the best way to get those out. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. All right, I, in all seriousness, I see this video of drones, police drones, hovering over people's backyards, dry, flying up their alleys to make sure there's so, social distancing. And it's not amazing to me that they would do it. So I appreciate the fact that politicians are the, the worst scum of the earth. What's amazing to me is how many people, including people on the right, who are like, well, yeah, they should do that. What, what kind of country do we have here now? Yeah, it, it is really incredible and uh, pretty scary when you see how many people, how many people who call themselves conservative and small government uh, all of a sudden are completely okay with a statist solution uh, because they're scared of a virus. And, you know, I, I think it, it really is showing people for who they really are. And it certainly is not American to say, well, we like our freedom, but only when we feel safe and, and we feel secure. Otherwise, we'd like to give our freedoms to the government because the government knows best. I mean, you and I know that's not the way to do, do things. It is discouraging to see, but I will say this as a silver lining. I think there are a lot of Americans who previously were on the side of uh, the state, who previously were on the side of we need big government to tell us what to do. And I think that they've had enough. I think that they realize the error of their ways. Now, I'm not saying all of them, but I have seen a lot of them who have, they've been happy to stay indoors and they've been happy to wait for a, a short amount of time. And now they're done. And they're looking at their watches and they're saying, okay, you know what? 
this has become unlivable, intolerable. We've got to get up. We've got to get back to work. We've got to feed our families. And they're not going to stand for it anymore. And I think if we want to look at a silver lining, that's probably it, is that it's at least alerting these people to know, hey, next time something like this rolls around, you can't give the government an inch because you know that they will then take a mile. Well, I'm glad you brought them up because I have a little issue there and I need you to help me work this out. So they supported the lockdowns, which I don't think they should have. You don't think they should have, but they supported the lockdowns. Now they're tired of being locked down and they want out. Get all that. That's fine. Let's let's rally the troops and let's get out. But maybe this is petty. Maybe I'm wrong. I need I need some closure. I need somebody to step up and say, hey, I was wrong from the beginning because here's my problem, Sarah. We have all these people, and I'm mainly talking about people on the right, who were locked down this and locked down that and get back in your house. And what they did was pave the roads for Democrats to get everything they've ever wanted. And I'm not getting any, I was wrong, I shouldn't have done it. I haven't seen one person do that. Yeah, I agree. I haven't as well, but I don't think that I don't think that we will see that. Now, I understand uh, that you personally want to see someone say that they were wrong because your show is in fact called "I'm Right." So I understand that you uh, you want to be right, mm-hmm. and you are. You were right, and you should feel vindicated by that. But I think in this you know divisive society that we live in, where everyone has their own you know political uh, hill to die on, I just don't think that we're going to see any sort of apology, any sort of acknowledgement, especially not when you have the scientific community who is the worst at that. Any time that they're wrong in any of their models, I mean, when it, if it comes to climate change or if it comes to the coronavirus, it doesn't matter. They won't admit or acknowledge that they were wrong. They will simply, you know, point to a flaw in the projection that couldn't have, you know, you couldn't have seen it occur. Uh, only in hindsight could you have seen it happen. I mean, you know, they're going to use every excuse in the book. And when they have the scientists who are doing that uh, as a model for them, I don't think anyone is going to want to admit their, their flaws, but they see it. And I think that that's what you and I can know, is that whether or not they admit it, they see it and they know it and we know it. And hopefully they'll remember that next time this comes up. Hopefully we'll. By the way, production team, can we make sure we cut a video of Sarah saying I was right? We need to play that on a loop next show. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Thank you. I did see, and this this part I found to be very interesting. Japan, Japan has not seen the numbers we've seen. And you can make all the excuses you want of they got on this early or whatnot. Japan has refused to lock down. But setting all that other stuff aside, what I found interesting is once I dug into it and actually did some reading, which isn't isn't that bad, by the way. That's the first time for me. (laughs) Japan, they are all about civil liberties over there now. I guess post-World War II, because that government was so crappy, they passed all these new laws. And Japan flat out came out and said, we don't have the authority to lock people down. Sarah, how does Japan not have the authority to lock people down. And here in the land of the free, we do. Yeah, you know, I mean, I I would say that we don't. We just simply are rolling over and letting the government assume powers that they don't actually have. But I think that the, the dangers that we have here in America are that we have such a privileged society. We have Uh, this overprivileged bubble that we've been living in so many freedoms for so long that we've learned to take them for granted. And when I say we, I don't mean you and I. I mean the people who, you know, the social justice warriors, a lot of people on the left. There are a lot of people who take those freedoms for granted because they don't remember what life was like without them. We've simply had them for so long. We've been living in this, you know, first world for so long that they have no perspective to give on this. They have no perspective to fall back on. There are a lot of people who are voting right now who have no idea what it was like to live in the era of 9-11, for instance. And so I think that that's the danger in having such a great free society is that you have these people who have absolutely no perspective on what it could be like if those freedoms were taken away. And that's how you get people who will just gladly roll over if the government says you need to do something or else your life is in danger. They say, yes, sir, can I have another? And, you know, I, I hate to see it happen, but I don't know that they will gain that perspective unless something actually personally happens to them to give them that perspective, sadly. Sarah Gonzalez, The Blaze TV, The News and Why It Matters. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. You're not going to believe this. Hang on. Well, that's enough bad news for the day. I've had about as much of that as I can stand. Let us remember, 
that Donald Trump is running for re-election in November. We know that. But he does get to face Joe Biden. Yes, Donald Trump has an uphill, you know, he's got an uphill battle here. With an economy this bad, any president's going to have an uphill battle. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. He won by 50,000 votes the last time, not 50 million. But he does get to face Joe Biden. And when you have a president like John, well, like Donald Trump, who is willing to blast away at any sign of weakness in his political opponents, and you give him somebody like Joe Biden, who is unable to get out a complete sentence without embarrassing himself, that is going to make for some of the most entertaining campaign fodder I've ever seen in my entire life. Donald Trump chose to take one of the weirdest speeches Joe Biden's ever given and dub in Obama's face to it and tweet this out to his millions of Twitter followers. And well, here it is. Oh, not another commercial. The kid used to come up and reach in the pool and rub my leg down so it was straight and then watch the hair come back up again. They look at it. So I learned about roaches. I learned about kids jumping on my lap. And the fact that he, it's not just that it exists. You know, lots of these underground video makers have existed before when it comes to presidential campaigns. And the president will kind of, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, laugh at it. Trump gets a hold of this stuff and he just blasts it out. <laughs> Gosh. All right. It's Monday. We'll do this again Tuesday. See you.